My name's Justin Tuddy. I'm a local resident. Thank you. Yes, go ahead, Mr. Tuddy. Um, yeah, well, th thanks again for all your work. It's going really well, I reckon. I'm really enjoying it. Um, I've really enjoyed today following the proceedings, and I, I thank you for the interim report. Um, I've, I've been learning a lot through this process. Um, you'll remember we met before, and I described to you that I see the climate risks and impacts of uh, fracking in the NT as an outright disqualification, and I, I want you to recommend that it should be absolutely rejected. Um, <clears throat> Mr. Tully, I do need to just make it abundantly clear that we have no mandate and you will never find in any report that we issue a recommendation to the government that the moratorium be lifted or stay. That is absolutely the ballywick of the government, not us. Hmm. Um, I, I did also enjoy that um, discussion previously about fugitive emissions, like um, I can see how you've been grappling with this, as have some of the participants in the process, and I appreciate that you've taken on a lot of new information. Um, I recognise that you're burdened with certain expectations about somehow divining ways to mitigate, manage, monitor, report these um, kind of new risks, things that people haven't dealt with very well before, and so um, while I'm not satisfied at all. I'm, I appreciate the good work that you're doing, the important work that you're doing. Um, what, I, what I don't really appreciate from the interim report is all that discussion about coal. I thought we had a good exchange last time. Um, I, wrote, I wrote you a letter, I gave you re resources, and I just don't understand why your interim report talks about coal. I wonder whether you could shed light on that. I wonder if there's a misunderstanding. Is there something I missed? Uh, Mr. Tully, this is your opportunity pre to present to us. This is not a two-way dialogue today. Um, I w if, if you wish to get involved in a two-way dialogue, then I would urge you to come to one of our uh, community uh, uh, forums where that type of interaction can take place. But this is your opportunity to present us with information today. Thank you. I had a similar opportunity before where I, I believed I gave you uh, good, sensible, logical information about why it was ridiculous to be comparing the threat of NT fracked gas to coal. I don't understand why you're continuing to make that comparison. Um, I, I don't understand why the sensible logic I presented to you previously is not evident in your interim report. Uh, I call upon you to have another look at what I've given you already. Um, I invite you to consider whether you can defend the nonsense that you've written comparing gas to coal. No one should be using coal now. No one should be using gas now. I think someone said previously today that if the best you can say about this threat is that it might be better than coal, it's, it's, it's got nothing to go for it. Um, I would like to refer to one particular sentence from your interim report and try to share with you my disgust. <clears throat> For a gas field producing 1,000 terajoules per day of gas, where all of this additional natural gas displaces coal from electricity production in Australia, the net greenhouse gas savings are some 26 megatons CO2 equivalent a year. 5% of Australia's greenhouse gas emission inventory. We don't use gas in, we don't use coal in the NT. And my understanding is that all these frackers want to export as fast as possible to the first available buyer. I'm not aware of any structure that lets us imagine that this gas might be displacing coal in Australia. I, I described that to you last time and I see no evidence in your report that there might be. Uh, similarly, I'm not aware of any international structure that might give us any confidence that quickly ripped up and exported NT fracked gas may be displacing coal anywhere in the world. I urge you to consider from a risk management perspective the likelihood that anti-fracked gas would be 
exploited in addition to rather than displacing coal? Perhaps by locking in new gas-fired power stations, it would be perversely displacing the uh, likelihood of cleaner, sustainable, long-term renewable alternatives. Um, I, I encourage you to give greater consideration to the risk of displacing cleaner technologies than the unfounded uh, fantasy of displacing dirty coal. Um, I, th I, th I think you've heard, if not discussion, then maybe reference today about the fella in the suit was talking about when we'd get all the money, when we'd get all the jobs, when we'd see this bonanza, middle of next decade. I encourage you to consider the likely status of renewable industries, technologies by the middle of next decade. Personally, I'm thinking deeply about whether there might be great economic benefit in addition to the obvious environmental benefit of sitting back for those 10 years. I think there might be greater financial benefit, economic benefit, jobs, in addition to the obvious environmental benefit of a livable climate, to come from <coughs> holding on to the likelihood <coughs> of effective renewable displacement of all fossil fuels rather than clinging to this fancy hood of um, gas displacing coal. Um, I think that's all I have for you today. I mean, there was much I'd like to explore. There. It was, you know, it's, it's so entertaining, it's so interesting and enjoyable. Um, but w what I want you to do for, for me is to lose this nonsense about coal and think more seriously about the risk of gas displacing solar. Thank you very much, Mr. Tuddy. Any questions? Yes, may, Dr. Beck. Make some observations. So, thanks very much for your, your comments on the uh, on on Chapter Nine. Uh, in terms of putting some context around some of the comments that you've made, I, I'll just note that um, uh, I think it's in Table Nine Point One, uh, where there are estimates made initially as to what uh, that 1,000 terajoule per day would represent in gross additions to the greenhouse gas inventory for Australia, uh, without considering what use the gas was put to. So, and I think in the report, uh, there is probably effectively two scenarios. One is just a uh, total gas supply of 1,000 terajoules per day, and that represents about 5%, I think, of uh, Australia's greenhouse gas emissions without taking into account any consideration of how that gas would be used. There's a second uh, entry there. I think it's 3,400 terajoules where there is a an allowance for gas to be... Uh, I think it's, it might be 80%. I'll have to... I need to check. 80% would be used for export and 20% would be used for, um, uh, for domestic uh, application. And in taking into account the uh, 80%, then allowance is made for the emissions that uh, arise from the actual compression of the gas and the transport of the gas to an overseas market. So there is those considerations that are there. And so that's phase one of the considerations, trying to get an estimate of what the total uh, gross load would be. And then in looking at what might be the net load, uh, in terms of we have to look at uh, potential applications for gas. Now, in terms of gas, um, there are many potential applications. Uh, it ranges from possible electricity um, generation. It includes domestic use for both space heating and cooking. Uh, it includes commercial use for similar reasons, and it includes industrial use, which could be for process or feedstock. So there are multiple potential uses 
uh, of gas uh, in the marketplace uh, from domestic through to industrial through to electricity. Uh, in terms of taking one particular one of those spectrum, we did then say, OK, now let's look at the comparison if all of that gas was used for coal, replacement of coal. Now, you know, one can mount an argument that uh, that may not be necessarily the case, uh, but uh, it was one way of at least trying to characterise what uh, would be uh, the net result. So this then looks at the net result of greenhouse gases uh, should there be uh, substitution uh, for coal versus uh, the application of gas. Um, and as I've noted previously here, um, in, in terms of electricity generation, then there can be uh, uh, considerations that I mentioned before in terms of the Finkel report who did look at the uh, interplay between the various forms of renewable energies and fossil fuels and on the data that was available, uh, the, the application of gas did fall from 6% to 3% from uh, 2020 to uh, 2035. Um, so I'm just trying to put some of the, uh, the work of that Chapter 9 into context into response to some of the observations that you made. Thank you. Yeah, I, I did read the whole chapter. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm aware there are other uses for gas mm. than producing electricity. And um, I guess I used to be open to that. Um, <coughs> less and less so over time, but yeah, mm. I'm just here today focusing on that bit of nonsense, which really just displeased me. I, I, I don't see any place for that analysis in your work. And, and it did cause me to think, why are we not worrying about the um, more significant and likely risk of actually displacing better energy alternatives. Yep. Noted. Thank you very much.